Hello. 51 years ago, I was born here in uh, Visby and uh, raised by my uh, parents. And I also have uh, a big sister and a younger brother. Uh, at the age of uh, six, uh, our dad uh, built us a house out on the countryside. And the whole family moved from Visby out here on the countryside. And I started to go to school in the middle of uh, Gotland in Roma. At the same uh, age, six, I uh, was starting to play uh, ice hockey and uh, soccer. And uh, that was pretty much my, my life for many, many years. I was going to school, I played sports, and uh, I hanged out with my uh, family and uh, friends. So I had a really sort of uh, normal life, I think, that uh, a lot of people have. Um, in the late uh, teen years, uh, when I was uh, 18, going 19, I uh, met uh, my first real love in life, Josephine. Uh, she was 17 years old, and uh, we couldn't believe that we found each other. We, we felt like we found each other's uh, soulmate, and everything uh, felt so natural between us. And, uh, and we really enjoyed uh, life and uh, had a lot of fun together. Uh, we were into our relationship maybe f five, six months. Uh, and we were here in Visby where her parents uh, lived. Uh, and we were home uh, at her mom's place uh, where she stayed with her man. And we uh, were supposed to go out to uh, my parents' place uh, out in the countryside. Uh, and it was a school night, so we were going to spend the night in my place and then go to school together. Uh, on Seve here in uh, Visby the day after. So we said goodbye to uh, her mom and man, and, uh, and uh, we uh, took my car and drove out uh, to, uh, to my house. And uh, we met uh, the whole family in the house, and uh, my, uh, my mom and uh, Josephine sat down by the kitchen table on the lower level uh, and spoke to each other. and. Uh, my whole family really loved Josephine, and uh, that was uh, something uh, really important for me and uh, really nice to see that uh, mom and Josephine can sit and talk together. And, uh, and uh, it meant a lot to me because my family is my everything. So you really want your family to uh, get along with your uh, girlfriend. So it made me really happy to see that. And uh, I was a little bit tired. It was pretty late in the evening. and. Uh, I said to uh, to Josephine, I said good night to the family, and I said to Josephine, I go upstairs to to my bedroom, and uh, you can uh, you can come when you when you feel like it. And she said, yeah, yeah, Nicholas, I I come up in a few minutes. She said, so I run up the stairs and I uh, go to the bathroom on the top level, and uh, I go into my be bedroom, and after a few minutes, uh, Josephine uh, come up the stairs. She looks into the uh, bedroom and tell tells me uh, not to uh, fall asleep before she comes and I said okay I'll stay awake and uh, she uh, went to the bathroom and uh, everything was completely normal we were uh, healthy happy everything was uh, exactly like it used to be and she come into to the bedroom and uh, we are, we are really happy and. Uh, laughing and kissing and hugging and all of a sudden when we're laying in bed Josephine uh, says to me uh, wait a little bit Nicholas and uh, I said yeah well what's uh, what's wrong Josephine and uh, and she didn't answer and I said again Josephine what's what's happening wha wha what's going wrong and she didn't answer and then I understood really quickly that something uh, happened to Josephine that she couldn't answer and uh, I screamed down to my uh, parents on the lower level uh, to call an ambulance, uh, and they did. And uh, dad came up, the whole family came up to, to the bedroom, and uh, everybody was running around. It was chaos, and uh, I tried to do a mouth-to-mouth -mouth and uh, when we were waiting for the ambulance. And the ambulance was actually there very quickly. It didn't take them many minutes to be there. And they went into my uh, bedroom and told us all to go out. And they closed the door. And they, um, they tried to, to make her come back again to conscious. And uh, after a while, they opened the door. They come out with her on the bed. 
on a stretcher and they go downstairs and they tell us you have to come after uh, with your own car and we did we took uh, our own car uh, and drove into uh, Visby uh, hospital and uh, we met her uh, family there Josephine's sister her mom and everybody in her family I, and we we sat down in a room uh, together with them and uh, everybody was in shock what was going on we didn't understand anything and uh, it it felt like it took forever uh, before the doctor came and and uh, gave us some news there and the doctor came opened the door and said um, i have uh, really tragic news but it was nothing we could do for josephine she's uh, she passed away and we couldn't believe it well, what was going wrong she felt completely fine uh, a second before this and uh, didn't complain about anything uh, everything was uh, exactly as normal and uh, it turned out uh, after a while that um, that her heart just stopped from nothing basically uh, it can happen to small babies that, that are f completely normal, that they can die from a sudden death with nothing wrong with them. And it can also happen to people later in life, but it's very rare, uh, fortunately. But uh, unfortunately for Josephine, it happened to her. It was a sudden heart stop that came from nothing. They did uh, an autopsy here on uh, Gotland on her. There was nothing wrong with her. They sent her away to Stockholm and did a second autopsy, autopsy and they couldn't find anything. So this was really hard to, to, to grasp for all of us. Uh, the shock was just getting bigger and confusing and we, we, uh, it was a total tragic for her family, for my family, for her friends and for, for me and my friends, of course. And this happened in, uh, in May. She was only 17 years old, and I was—I uh, just turned 19. Uh, in the end, uh, middle end of the May, it happened, and um, I was uh, ta uh, going out from uh, school, graduating in uh, in uh, June, just a few weeks after this. And uh, I was totally devastated, and didn't want to graduate. I didn't want to do anything. Uh, it was like life uh, just disappeared for me um, at this point when I was uh, graduating my my life uh, light was burning very very little I, I didn't I couldn't understand what's happening from from one second to the other I was the felt like the most happy guy in the world to uh, be the most unhappy guy in the world that's how I felt and uh, I couldn't believe that was happening to her and to me and um, the summer came and uh, we we were supposed to have our our first summer together so uh, i also uh, was going to summer work and I, and i chose a work that i worked really early in the morning and late afternoon so josephine and me could spend uh, the days together and uh, have the time of our life um, and did this didn't happen and uh, of course and i i couldn't i couldn't believe it i anyway i went to work from the countryside, from my home, into to Visby, early mornings, every morning at around five o'clock, I took my car and drove into Visby. And I started in, in right after school, so in the beginning of June, I started there, and uh, something like two months after her uh, death, I, uh, uh, I sat in my car, and I had, be I had been eating very poorly, and I had been sleeping horrible, and and life was uh, really low for me uh, at this point uh, and uh, i felt I, f I remember i felt a little bit dizzy when i was sit sitting down in the car and and drove into visby for uh, for the million tanta summer and uh, at five o'clock in the morning and then i don't remember much but i came off the road with my car if i fell asleep or if i had a blackout i don't know uh, I, I uh, get my conscience back when I'm, I'm on the ground in the woods and uh, apparently I had drove off the road into a telephone pole and it didn't stop the car and it went into a tree and it con took completely stop 
from uh, a high speed. So uh, I was um, flying out from the car, and somewhere on the on the way to the ground, I broke my back. And that's what I I got told afterwards. So I tried. I was laying. The, nobody saw the accident when it happened. So I was laying there in the woods for two hours, from five o'clock to seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, with the, we have eighteen ribs. I broke nine and I also broke my back. So it was a really severe uh, accident. And um, to look back on it, it's uh, some sort of miracle that I didn't bleed. Uh, so much inside that I that I died from that in the woods, but after two hours, some uh, road workers came to um, to the road and saw my car standing in the in the woods, and they didn't understand why is it a car in there, and they go in there and they find me on the ground, and they called the ambulance, and I was getting into Visby Hospital, and uh, they realized that this is a severe injury that doesn't happen so often here on Gotland fortunately uh, so they felt like they I needed to come to experts in uh, in Karolinska hospital in Stockholm so they flew me up the same day I had the injury the accident they flew me in a helicopter up to um, Stockholm I don't remember anything of that trip but I remember when I come to uh, to the hospital and I'm there and I, ha I can't uh, move uh, I'm not allowed to move anything. I can't move my legs. I don't feel my legs, but I, I am not also not allowed to move my upper body. I have to lay still on my back for one month uh, to heal the back. And during this time, maybe three weeks after I came to uh, Karolinska, the doctor came into to the room and uh, my family was there and he uh, told us to that Niklas, unfortunately, you've been through this accident, and uh, this is meaning that you will never be able to walk again. And I think most people, when they get that kind of news, they uh, burst into tears and they get devastated. I, I more or less did like this. Okay, I didn't, I didn't start to cry even because I was do so down. I was so low. My life uh, light was so low that it almost was out. So I felt like, okay, it's one thing, more thing that happened to me. Now I can't play ice hockey anymore either, uh, which was really my life then. So uh, I was there. I, I was there actually for six months in the hospital from July in the middle of the summer until Christmas that year. And after three months, I... Uh, I got up in a wheelchair after one month, after laying on the back, and I started to do rehabilitation. And during this time, when I tried to, to learn everything you have to learn, like uh, get dressed and uh, transferring like you need to do, uh, and, and yeah, you have to start all over again with everything, basically. It's a new life for you. And I started to do that two times a day in the rehabilitation uh, level there in the hospital. and. I felt like, what is this? Uh, this is not what life was meant to be for me. Uh, it was supposed to be together happily with Josephine. I was supposed to play ice hockey. I was supposed to walk. But I took a, a decision there. After three months in the hospital, I, I said to myself, this is not you, I, like being here in between something and uh, be really unhappy. Are you going to be like this for the rest of your life? Or what is it going to be like? So I, I basically gave myself two choices. Either you stop this life, you kill yourself, or you take this road, and you take one day at a time, and you try to be independent and uh, be the best you can in a wheelchair and be able to take completely care of yourself, and then you see how, how life uh, can treat you, if you can find happiness in life again. And luckily, I, I chose that road. And after one year after my uh, accident, I actually, 20 years old, moved away from home, like uh, most people maybe do, and uh, it didn't stop me that I was uh, totally paralyzed in my legs. I did everything. I, I learned how to transfer to, to a bathtub and up again, which is a very compli uh, complicated transfer. I, I, uh, I cleaned my home. I did the laundry. I, I um, cooked my food. I got a car with hand controls. I got myself a job, 
And I, I saw with every th little step I took, I saw that uh, I can do so much still, even if it's in a wheelchair, that I used to do. So you can't, you can't steer at the little things you can't do anymore. You can't run in, in, in mountains. You can't run on a sand beach that you loved. But you can do maybe 90% of what you used to do. So maybe this life isn't so bad anyway. And all this time in, in, in the hospital, and it gave me a little bit perspective to Josephine's death. I was, I was completely devastated, of course, still. But, uh, but, but I felt like every day was a, a little bit better. And that's what I want to transfer over to you, that everybody, everybody's life is up and down. I think that's what life is all about. Nobody have a life that is going like this. And I don't think anybody wants a life to go like this. And for some people, of course, uh, life hits harder than other. Uh, but we all go up and down. And I, I, my, my uh, advice is that just, just try to, when you are on a low, because everybody's gonna uh, go down in a low. I still gonna go, to go down in lows, but not get stuck down there. Be, be sort of comfortable with your misery for a while. And and uh, and kind of embrace it and and think that it's an end of this. It's a it's a light in the tunnel because believe me, time heals enough to not give up this life. I'm so happy today that I didn't give up life. Everything was very sad and and, and is a little bit sad still, but I'm very happy now and I have a good life. Uh, and you have you only have one life that we know of. So take care of it and, uh, and try to, to trust that life is going to turn around, even if you don't know how. I didn't know how when I was 19, 20 years old. I didn't know. How is it going to be good? How can it ever be good? And here I am. I, w I was starting to play wheelchair tennis. Instead of ice hockey, I found wheelchair tennis. I, start I, I got good pretty quickly, so I started to travel all over the world. I, I had a goal to go to the Paralympics. I made finally the Paralympics after 12 years of hard work every day, basically. I went to Athens 2004 and played tennis there. After Athens, I started to play basketball and I got in the, in the national team of basketball and we won the European Championship 2007. And that's the only time Sweden have won the European Championship before and even since then, Sweden haven't done it. So I was really happy with that and that made us go to to Beijing 2008 to the Paralympics and here is a photo of the uh, opening ceremony and uh, here is a fight down there it was like a, a full globe and arena with 12 13,000 people watching and I also got different jobs that that made me happy and I have to say I also have a great family who has been supporting me all the way and that helped me a lot, of course, and also good friends. And some people don't have that, and I know that, and it's harder. And I think it would be a lot harder for me to be alone with this. But maybe you can find somebody who can, you can talk to, somebody you can trust, and, and do that before you give up too early. Because I think so many young people that end life gi are giving up too early. I think sometimes it's, it's, it could turn around just to talk to somebody about it and, and uh, get a little bit of help to go through the really heavy parts of your life. And um, I think I'm nothing really special here. I'm a normal human being, but when life comes to that edge that you, you feel like don't want to live anymore and you're going to uh, either end your life or live, then you realize that li uh, life is so much more than walking and and uh, everything else for me so i hope that you can uh, hang in when you have tough times and go through it and then you can feel the really highs in life too thank you very much <laughs>